Mama, I got bad news, bad news. I've been rolling with some bad dudes, bad dudes. I've been trying to get a bag to a bag to Hello, listeners. Welcome to the Ashes to Awesome podcast, Rising in Recovery. Our podcast provides light, hope, and understanding about addiction and mental health to those living within that life and the people who love them. Today's episode is brought to you by Gotcha Treatment Centers in Phuket, Thailand. They are a clinic run by clinicians, not a business run by businessmen. And they know that where addiction is the smoke, trauma is the fire. Learn more at yatracenters.com. That's Y-A-T-R-A-C-E-N-T-R-E.com. Hey, listeners, welcome to another edition of the Weekend Ramble on the Ashes to Awesome podcast. I'm your host, Chuck LaFlange, and today I am joined by my co-host, Lisa. Of course, how are you doing today, Lisa? I'm very good. Thanks, Chuck. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's good to see you again. It's been a week. And mm-hmm. we have a special guest today. Uh, he's a prominent psychiatrist with fellowships in addiction medicine and pain medicine. He's a clinical assistant professor at the University of Calgary Cummings School of Maine, or Medicine. Sorry. He is the chief medical officer of the Newley Institute, aiding mental health through rehab and work programs. He co-chairs the Alberta Pain Strategy, leads clinical initiatives like the Opioid Deprescribing Program, and holds awards like the Early Career Leadership Awards. Beyond these roles, he's part of the Calgary Police Commission and contributes to health policy. He's a research force focusing on addiction, trauma, opioids, and more tied to the University of Calgary's research centers. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rob Tangay. Thanks so much. I'm uh, really excited and honored to be here. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I got to say, that's the longest introduction I've ever given. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a lot of things going on there, Rob, Dr. Rob. It's embarrassing sometimes to listen to. So, <laughs> uh, Humility suits you well. So, um, so to the listeners, I, I had actually uh, talked to, to Dr. Tangay months ago now, I guess, but things didn't work out. Um, Lisa's managed to do what she does and well, he's, we've got him sitting here on the show with us today and I'm, I'm really excited for that. So, um, what's your story, Dr. Shange? <laughs> Let's just start there. And, you know, how do you get to where you are, you know, the cliff notes version and, and, and doing what you're doing, right? Oh man. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, very late into university. I was a college dropout at 17, um, spent 10 years in sales and then owning some uh, small uh, personal proprietorships and then ended up at a corporate position working down in in New Zealand. Um, Before I really said to myself, I really want to go back to school. And I I felt like I kind of messed up that first year of college. I mean, by all means, I had a lot of fun, uh, but I, (laughs) I didn't really know how to study. I really didn't understand what was necessary and required. And so uh, I left kind of my career and and moved back home from New Zealand to uh, Alberta and uh, started redoing courses that I failed, redid some high school courses, ended up in a a degree in neuroscience down in Lethbridge and then just casually. Uh, I remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it's, I mean, once you get into university, you can kind of do whatever you want, but okay. um, I, I remember a bunch of friends wanting to go to this University of Calgary med school presentation. I was like, I'm not interested in that at all. And I'll come mm-hmm. along. So I went and a lady named Adele was there presenting. And if you've been to the University of Calgary Medical School, you know, Adele. Uh, she was amazing. She did this incredible presentation. I was like, man, that sounds much better than the rats I work with. Um, (laughs) and, uh, yeah, I applied to med school and got in, in Calgary and Edmonton and chose Calgary and, um, didn't really know what I was going to do, but it was my psychiatry rotation, um, that I really enjoy. I thought I was going to be neurology or surgery, or even looked at dermatology for a while, but uh, I did a rotation uh, up in Pinoca after that, and I, I really loved it. Um, I really found that it was a lot of like the research I was doing with rats, which was about brain and behavior, um, and the intersection of, of understanding the behavior of, of people. Um, and I felt like I could really help people, and I, I liked that part of it. Um, and I'm someone who struggles with chronic pain and have for, you know, since I was 21, uh, so I, I wanted to do pain as, as part of my training, which turns out you can do anything you want and become a pain physician. Uh, so I ended up in psychiatry. I did an addiction fellowship to be a better pain physician. And now I probably do much, much more uh, addiction 
than anything, but really it, it was learning how many of my patients struggle with trauma and PTSD, both in the pain and the addiction world, that I really kind of pursued that area of interest. And there's no fellowships in becoming a PTSD expert, but once you, you understand it and work in it, uh, you realize just how undiagnosed it is. Wow. Wow. So well, you answered like my next three questions, which is great. <laughs> You're pretty easy guest to have. So um, there's a couple of things I want to pick out, uh, you know, from, from the introduction here. And the one that, that immediately jumped out at me was the opioid deprescribing program. I've never heard of anything like that. I, I'm ignorant to it. So what's that all about? Yeah, it's uh, so it's it's. It's just coming back to life. Um, so it was a, a program because of my intersection with pain and addiction. There's a lot of uh, individuals who struggle with daily pain and struggle with either opioid addiction or poor control of their opioids or quite simply um, the opioids aren't really improving their function and getting off of prescription opioids is really, really hard. Um, and so we opened a program to help people get off and it ended up becoming a complex program where we got mostly people struggling with addiction, uh, and, uh, had some chronic pain where it was initially kind of focused on mostly chronic pain with maybe a bit of addiction. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, uh, operations, uh, has a, a strong role in, in Alberta health services and, they deemed that this was a primary care issue, not a specialty issue, and it was closed. Now, uh, it's been re reinstated with some funding in a, a provincial virtual program called the Alberta Provincial Pain Program, Alberta okay. Virtual Pro Provincial Pain Program, which is uh, just underway as we speak. And the deep prescribing program should come online in the next year or so. So, so uh, it'll be here for all Albertans. So. Is that in like a kind of a parallel to the oat or is it, um, it is. Kind of independent of that, right? It, it worked inside of the, the uh, ODP or the opioid uh, dependency program. Okay. Um, so I would take a lot of the referrals from some of the physicians that work there with pain and, and addiction patients. Uh, but once, once the community learned we were there, most of our referrals came from primary care and we got flooded and, um, it was myself and a couple of nurse practitioners, an incredible psychologist. Um, and yeah, we did amazing work. It was a, a ton of fun. Uh, we changed a lot of people's lives and we had some great news media out of it. And I still stay in touch with some of those patients today. Oh, wow. That's got to be is that sort of, is that driven by the fact that chronic pain, the evidence supports that opiates, opiates shouldn't really be used for chronic pain. Yeah, so you know, uh, this was this was going back a few years, but kind of the beginning of of what was called the opioid crisis. Now it's then it was the overdose crisis, then the toxic drug crisis. Anyways, there's new names for it. Uh, just wait a couple months. Um, but uh, at that time, you know, we saw significant overprescribing of opioids. Um, you know, you stubbed your toe, you got fifty Percocets to go home with. Um, yeah, you, you had a tooth pulled, you got a hundred perk sets to go home with. So <laughs> we, we, we had no, um, no regulation on our prescribing. Um, and, and really we were taught quite simply, uh, palliate the pain. So if somebody's in pain and not functional, uh, an opioid will improve their function and, and help them remove the pain and you keep going. There's yeah. no ceiling. You just keep going till the pain's gone. Uh, but more and more data was actually showing that's not true and that, in fact, many people were ending up with opioid-induced hyperalgesia or the opioids long-term cause pain. Uh, no oh. different than a lot of our, our substances. Alcohol does the same thing. Uh, so you know, I started uh, in my fellowship tapering people and taking on some of the most difficult patients at, at the chronic pain center. And we saw people getting better. And uh, okay. I pursued trying to open that. It took a few years uh, afterwards, and uh, we we had a good run for a couple of years, and we'll we'll get her going again. Wow, uh, it's it's funny because just three days ago, I was I, I watched that series on Netflix, that new one that um, uh, yeah. uh, what's it the, about? Yeah, Purdue or whatever. So this yeah. is all kind of. But I guess you're about the same age as me, so you would have been not quite into your medical career when when all that was going on, right? When when all that began, the, the whole Purdue thing, and when. Correct. When Oxcontin first hit the it. scene, I yeah. guess, right? Yeah, 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 right. So I remember, and of course, it's just my experiences, but 
Um, I remember saying to somebody back then, I don't know anybody who's been prescribed this shit and not been addicted to it. I don't know a single mm-hmm. person, right? Of course, I might speak to the people I was hanging out with too, but you know, <laughs> let's be honest at that point in my life. But uh, it, it was scary, scary stuff. And, and I guess, you know, it, it's still, well, a lot of people are still there and as, as a result of what happened back then. Eh? So, Yeah, it's, it's where it started. There's no yeah. question. Um, you know, you can watch the documentary. Uh, I, I lectured on almost everything in the documentary. So now I don't need to lecture <laughs> on that anymore. You can go watch Netflix. Uh, I but, guess okay. You know, you can't go around and tell everyone this is non-addictive and you can't say, well, for pain patients, it's not addictive, but maybe for other people, it's like, well, how, like, what? Where, right. where does that differentiation pull yeah. out of uh, someone's hat? Um, and, and, you know, um, a lot of people don't become addicted. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people genetically actually get sick and dizzy and don't feel good on opioids. Um, you know, I always, I always yeah. teach yeah. people if, if an opioid gives you energy, that's a red flag. If I have a patient who comes in and yeah. tells me, yeah. oh man, doc, that was, that was the right prescription that has changed everything. I feel great. <laughs> it's like, you're not getting it anymore. Yeah, like, that, is, right. that is really bad. You yeah. shouldn't feel great. Yeah. Um, but you know, some people, especially those who are genetically prone, get a lot of energy. They yeah. feel great. And, uh, Unfortunately, uh, the risk of losing control is very high in, in that group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a lot of other people, it masks all of your mental health symptoms. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. I, I know for myself, a, a couple of T3s and I turned into a, a blabbering moron. So I would, I would never, <laughs> right? It, 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 no interest. It, it, never in my uh, long and uh, comprehensive drug career did I get into opiates. So that was good. That was good. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you work with the police. What's that about? Well, um, so again, as, as I learned more and more about trauma, I ended up working uh, at the Operational Stress Injury Program. This is a federally funded private healthcare system for RCMP and veterans. Okay. Um, and so um, really wanted to be better suited for understanding trauma, treating trauma. And I figured, well, there's not a better place than treating first responders and military veterans who have some of the most horrific uh, traumas. It was different. Uh, Some of my colleagues will call that the big T versus the little T. I think that's super stigmatizing uh, to somebody who's got sexual trauma in their background and saying that's the little T. Um, So, you know, I I ended up working with a lot of police officers and um, really actually quite enjoyed it. And um, I have, I have friends and, and family who are police officers and really, uh, have a belief that I grew up in a small town with community police and I was a, a bit of, a uh, an ass as a kid. And, uh, you know, we, we did dumb things, but we, we knew all the officers by first name. They lived in the town with us. We grew up with them yeah. and it made a difference, right? There were times that, you know, they kind of give you a cuff in the back of the head, drive you home and let your parents take care of you, which was probably worse than, than them. Um, and I, I don't think that happens very much anymore. And I'm a big believer in it. And I think, when you have trauma, you're easily irritated, you're easily um, uh, set off. Um, and so we have a, a lot of officers kind of out there that were struggling, uh, couldn't access good treatment. Um, and, you know, that affects the relationship. You pull over someone, maybe they give you a bit of a hard time that turns into a pretty negative interaction. Um, and so, um, being on the commission was just kind of a, a long-term piece to that of, of really mm-hmm. believing in, in, you know, policing is an important part of our society and allows us to have our kids playing on the street and not worrying about them. But that said, how big of a role does stigma play in police? You know, well, the first responders in general, but specifically police, in, you know, addressing something like PTSD, right? Yeah. Um, uh, huge. Um, but I, the culture is changing. Uh, um, my next question. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it is. I, I did a great presentation. Uh, former commissioner lucky used to run chiefs of police, uh, meetings. So all the major cities chiefs would meet with the RCMP commissioners. And, uh, I presented to that about shifting culture by access to good care. Okay. Uh, and, and that's what the, the newly Institute does. Uh, and, 
you know, I, I talked about how we can shift culture because when, when, you know, Joe or Mary Beth go back to the force and they're telling everyone how amazing they feel, uh, some people are looking at them like, who are you? You're, you're not the same person as before. Um, and, and that starts to shift culture. And then when they realize they can get into it right away, that starts to shift any more, even more. And then when, um, you know, I had a testimonial from one of the chiefs standing up and saying, look, not only is, is what I'm saying correct, we see it in our precinct because of, of the newly being in our city. And uh, we've, we've already seen the shift. So it is always about being able to access good help and getting help. And I've always maintained that's how you break all stigma. Um, you know, cancer used to be highly stigmatized. When, when people got cancer, they didn't want anyone to know. They did it to themselves. As a society, we looked upon that, you know, cigarette smoking was often intermixed and, you know, you, you got what you asked for. And, but now nobody talks that way, but there's also a cancer center in every major hospital across this entire country. And we poured tons of money okay. into it and cancer is just another diagnosis, but it's accessible. It's available. Treatment is there and we normalized it. And we haven't done that in addiction. I'm, I'm, there you go. It's funny. You, you just pulled a, um, Hard out of Lisa's deck where we're going to go mm. with cancer to addiction. She does that often. So is this where you got it from? Lisa? Nice. Right? Or, is, or is she pulling a card out of I think Rob and I have ever, yeah, I don't think we've ever talked about it, but no. interesting that we both, you no. know, use that example. But yeah, I'll mm -hmm. often say that to people if they're saying something stigmatizing around addiction, I'll reframe it with cancer and say, would you think it's acceptable to say this out loud in public if we change the word addiction to cancer mm -hmm. or if we change the word addict to cancer patient and a lot of times it's just like no like I don't know Rob if you remember there was a coffee shop I won't say the one you know on here but there was a coffee shop in Calgary it was a few years ago and they had a, a campaign or an advertising marketing thing that they did around Christmas one year. And it was all about, you know, being addicted to their coffee. Like their coffee was so good. It was addictive. And I don't remember the exact verbiage, but I remember it bugged me and I went home and I wrote an email to them and basically <laughs> reframed it. Like, would you think it acceptable to change this right. word addiction in your marketing to cancer? Um, recognizing that there's so many people who are suffering in addiction and families who are suffering because they have loved one in addiction. And, you know, would you do this? And they took the campaign down or the marketing, it's not a campaign, but they That's took great. the marketing down. Um, and it was, it's a huge coffee shop in Cal like in Calgary. Um, right. But yeah, I think, I think it just helps that people. One, actually. Yeah. I'm not going to do it on, on, on air, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's you why know, I never I, asked. I think right? it's, yeah, right. they should get some kudos for, for responding to it. You know, uh, I think. Totally. It's just a lack of, of really uh, knowledge and understanding. I don't think people purposefully do oh, so it. There's no malice in it, uh, certainly. No, right? no. Yeah, yeah, right. um, <laughs> but it, it is unfortunate. We do see this a lot. And uh, I, I love what you say. I, I often talk about, imagine if we treated addiction like heart disease and cancer. Right. And <laughs> yeah. we had really? addiction centers everywhere like we do heart disease and cancer centers. Uh, the difference being heart disease and, and cancer you know, and, and prostate cancer specifically, where we see these massive prostate cancer centers. Uh, those are white male elderly things where a lot of the funding uh, is controlled uh, by. Yeah, uh, right. Addiction yeah. was often a younger, impoverished society that well, or simply so we thought. didn't work. Yeah. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. but simply didn't right. require that kind of funding. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Um, it kind of leads me into, into the next one here. So Lisa, with that very same line of, uh, of speak, um, we were talking about mandated treatments and, mm. and I'll, I'll tell you when the news first started to break here in Alberta, right. About what was going to happen and what they were thinking about doing. Uh, we were joking about this. I think just last week, Lisa, where I said, this was about to be the fuck, no mandated treatment program. Like I was going to, like, I was going on a mission, right. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> I'm still here. yeah. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like fired right up about the whole thing. The news story I saw framed it very differently than I think what will actually happen um, or maybe I just chose okay. to take it that way either way. It, it made it look like it was going to be a police state, or at least that's how I understood it. Right. right. So <laughs> went completely off about the whole damn thing. And then, you know, I, I'd mentioned it to Lisa and, and she used that, that same line, right? Well, we, we're helping people with mental health. We, you know, we, we mandate them into treatment, yeah. right? You know, if somebody's schizophrenic, danger themselves. The 
and and the shift not not just in myself but in, by extension the whole show changed right i went from these hardline views to really opening my mind because of that because of that way of speaking right so um and, and with that said um i don't know how much you're in the know about what's going on there's a lot of trepidation about what's about to happen in alberta as far as you know and i don't know mm -hmm. what you're allowed to speak to and i and you know i'm not going to pry that's, too that's hard, the but... better question yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah I do yeah. have some non-disclosure agreements but uh, yeah. we can talk about what what is in the public realm so yeah. we know for instance um in in massachusetts under section 35 it's one of the first areas that mandated addiction treatment separate from mental health uh, and in doing so, they had a ninety percent increase in referrals and started displacing voluntary patients. Referrals. What, what do you mean by that? Sorry. Well, so that's what they'd be called. They'd be called a referral. So, uh, okay. an individual who is now mandated to treatment was referred into a treatment center. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. but those treatment centers uh, were already quite limited, even though it had a, a bigger system than most in the U.S. Uh, and it significantly started displacing voluntary patients. So. That's the first thing you got to think uh, about. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if we looked at mandated treatment, so in, in Alberta, you can go to a judge and you can uh, have your loved one arrested and brought in for assessment uh, secondary to addiction. Now, as Lisa can attest to as much as anyone, uh, a psychiatrist will then discharge them from hospital saying we can't do that here uh, and there's really nowhere for you to go. Uh, other thing that you can say is a lot of those people come in because they're smoking pot and it's like, I'm not going to throw you into a lockdown <laughs> treatment center for smoking pot. There's, there's good treatment for that in the outpatient community. And so, you know, there's a few worries. One, we mandate treatment and every parent out there struggling with a, a friend or family or child is going to send them through this process Two. Um, every kind of criminal justice diversion is going to throw them into this process. Um, if we, if we start thinking, okay, are we mandating treatment for everyone? We don't even have close to no. the number of beds no. required for that. No. What are we on uh, a 30 still, or 60 day wait right now for people that want to go right? you know? in, yeah. in a province that has the best system in the country, yeah. uh, with yeah. the most access in the country by far. And we still have these kind of wait lists. Hey guys, I don't know if you've heard about my new podcast. It's called The Morning Cup of Kindness. It's five minutes. It's just a random story about kindness and it's a great way to start your day. The great part about it is you can advertise for a nonprofit or a fundraiser, any charity that you want for absolutely free. All you gotta do is come on, tell a five minute story about kindness for everybody else to start their day with. Boom, you've advertised for a great cause. If you're interested in doing that, you can reach out to us through any of the socials. You see the logo there, you can do that. Um, and to get it done, you can submit it or you can record with me in Virtual Studio. All the details are on our website at a2apodcast.com. Check it out. Thanks guys, now back to the show. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so first thing, thing before you can even thing, think about, well, you, you've got to yeah. build beds. No yeah, beds, yeah. no chance it can happen. So that's the most important thing. The The other part, I still, you know, stand by this as a, in, in shock and awe. Calgary is one of the only major centers in the country that doesn't have one, one not one addiction bed in its hospital system. Really? Not one. Nope, not one. Zero. Wow. They end up on psychiatry, right? If, if, if I, a I psychiatrist think, yeah. will keep them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was going to add to another interesting point, right? So what Rob is talking about, you know, with with the Mental Health Act is that mm -hmm. patients can be held in hospital under the Mental Health Act against their wishes if they meet certain criteria. Mm -hmm. Now, with people suffering an addiction, the most common, you know, message that you'll hear is that, well, you know, we can't hold them under the Mental Health Act. Um, and a lot of times when I've challenged colleagues as to what do you mean and why, um, and even have challenged review panels who review these certificates to decide whether to uphold them if a patient wishes, wishes to challenge them. I've been told repeatedly, well, that's just not what we do here. But if you look at the criteria <laughs> under the Mental Health Act, people in severe addiction, and again, like, yeah, not your kid smoking some, smoking some weed, but people in severe addiction absolutely meet criteria under the existing Mental Health Act to be held in hospital against their wishes. 
we do it with schizophrenic patients, we do it with depressed patients, we do it with a numerous, you know, multitude of other psychiatric illnesses. I imagine there's a lot of boxes but with to addiction, check, but can you, can you kind of, what are those criteria that, that you're speaking to that without doing, you know, having to explain your entire profession, right? Let's... Yeah, so they need to have, you know, some sort of impairment um, in their thinking, right? So they've got impaired judgment, they've got disorganized thought process, Check. so some sort of impairment there. Um, they need to, um, it needs to be an illness that's treatable, okay? Okay. Check. Okay. Um, criteria, I'm trying to do this without looking at the form. <laughs> <laughs> um, there needs to be either a risk of harm to themselves, a risk of harm to others, but there does like even beyond that, you don't need to be a risk of harm to anybody, but you can mm -hmm. simply be at risk of deteriorating in your mental yes. health or your physical health. Okay. Check. Yeah, um, and it needs box, to be yeah. that they won't stay voluntarily. Right. So if somebody's unwell, but they're like, well, yeah. I want to be here, then you wouldn't certify them because why would you? Yeah. Um, and, you know, Rob and I've even spoken about cases before where you'll have people sometimes come in who have addictions, who want help, who will say, can you please certify me? Like, yeah. I need yeah. to do this. I want help. But I'm telling you, in 12 hours or in three hours, Not I'm out chance. the door. Yeah. Like, yeah, can right. you please stop me? That yeah. muscle um, lucidity, right? The iron's hot. You gotta, yeah. got to grab but it. But so right? again, like, I feel like within the system, that to me is a huge demonstration of horrendous stigma. Because it's like, what do you mean we don't do that here? It's like, it's a mental health act. It, they satisfy most, criteria. Yeah. What are you, like, I don't care that, like, what your personal stigma. opinion is. Right. If they check yeah. the boxes, then why are we not doing this? No kidding. Um, no kidding. That, that is yep. crazy. That, that's an argument. I, I agree that's with crazy. that. I, I think, you know, as, as Lisa spoke about, it, it is that it's a treatable disorder, but there's also got to be the part that the disorder is, is being, the individual is being held in a program that can treat the disorder. Okay. So, yes. um, you know, we can't hold someone with, with suffering from schizophrenia uh, on an OBGYN unit with no psychiatrist providing treatment. Um, okay. So... Yeah. That's one of the problems that we have is most of our psychiatric units in, in Alberta have no one working there that has any expertise or knowledge about treating addiction. Uh, gotcha. And so, you know, there, there was a court case uh, not long ago where the individual one who was held because of uh, alcohol and cirrhosis um, and the psychiatrist felt if they... Uh, allowed the individual to go, they would start drinking again and probably die of uh, cirrhotic complications uh, and lost that case quite simply because they held him against his will for a significant period of time without providing any treatment. So, gotcha. Gotcha. It, you know, there's, yeah. there's always those balances. The other part is that the Mental Health Act is more focused on assessment and stabilization than treatment. So, mm. you know, Things like PCHAD, where we can uh, hold a, a, a child under the age of 18, uh, we can bring them in and force them into detox for like 10 days. Uh, yeah. That's actually detrimental in, in many cases and, and can put that person at high risk of overdose. Uh, yeah. We can't follow the same process in addiction where we're just going to take you in, hold you for, you know, whatever, a week or two until you're stable and then discharge you. That's called detox. And yeah. involuntary detox has much evidence to show that it's uh, detrimental, especially in opioids, specific to opioids. Mm -hmm. So there, there's lots of, of intricacies uh, that we have to look at. I, I agree 100% with what Lisa's saying. It's all stigma-based. It's also funding and money. Uh, we would never let someone uh, jump off a bridge in order to end their life, but we will allow them to inject a substance that will end their life. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's and, pure and hurt stigma. hundred people around them in the process, right? You know, it's, you know, it, right, which both commit would crime and all of that. Doing. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. It, it's it's an unfortunate reality that uh, it takes political will and significant funding okay. in order okay. to start shifting this. So, yeah. and, and I'm and guessing. I think there's, that, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. Yeah. I just I think there's that awareness, though. I don't think the right people talk about it, but there's the awareness that if we were to start doing that, then we would need to have the treatment available as Rob's saying, you know, cause we can't just hold them. We have to be holding them and treating them. Mm -hmm. um, and where, where do we put them? Like yeah. we don't well, have resources. Well, even if we no. have the beds, you know? where do we come, where, where do the people come from? 
right? I know the, the our healthcare system is pretty taxed in the way. Like of, you take you know, even from a psychiatric so, right? perspective, Chuck. Like like I was in Emerge last week. I work in the Emerge every second week, and last week I went in on Tuesday. Monday had been a holiday, and citywide, so at our four main hospitals, mm -hmm. we were holding thirty nine patients waiting for inpatient psychiatry beds. Wow, and and without you know, so, knowing so the, the actual units were staff, full. How many of that is involved or revolves around addiction? Or do you know offhand or, or can you take a guess? No. Educated? No. no. I mean, no. it's, okay. it's, no. there's always a huge addiction piece, right? Like even in yeah. people who no. have substance, like who have things like schizophrenia, it's often complicated then by substance it's use. So, often, so right? substance yeah. use yeah. is, it's a huge portion in some, in, at some level. Mm -hmm. But again, like you, think just psychiatry and these would be people who are not there primarily with a substance use disorder they're there with yeah. something above and beyond that okay. yeah. and right. you know like in one day like you've got every unit in the city is full we're filling mm -hmm. over capacity beds on our units and we still have you know 40 almost 40 people, people there. sitting in the em yeah. in the emergency departments waiting for beds yeah yeah and remind the people that are actually waiting for beds out right. in the emergency room so and, you know, the thing to remember, we have a, a massive methamphetamine uh, problem in, in <laughs> Alberta. Um, the, the exponential growth of methamphetamine seizures and use across the Canada is well um, uh, documented. Uh, we also see the same thing in cannabis. We see the same thing in alcohol. We want to talk about the toxic drug crisis, but what we have is an addiction crisis. Um, a substance use crisis is, is probably the correct word for it. Then we have to remember one in two people who are using meth daily or close to daily will end up psychotic. One in two. Really? They will all end up on a psychiatric unit um, or at least presenting to a hospital at one point. Uh, really? In many cases, they clear and emerge and are sent home because, oh, now you're not psychotic anymore. Not our issue. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, I've been there. Um, I never would have guessed that that anywhere close to that number. And I'm, yes, I'm just I'm coming out of the scene not that long ago myself, right? So that that's wow. Yeah, one right. and two will have paranoia. One and mm -hmm. two will have some sort of of psychotic delusional thinking. Uh, and and the sad part is is uh, probably around twenty to twenty five percent of them, if not higher will have a long-term sequelae of that. They won't be, they won't get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. They'll have insight around it, uh, mm -hmm. but they'll, they'll always feel like someone's following them. Someone's right behind them. The cops are watching them. Uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. how many patients I've talked to who went straight to the police station and said, you know, just arrest me. And the cops are like, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> no, you've been tapping my phones. I know, I know you've been watching me. And they're like, I really, we don't, but come yeah. on in, you know, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, and they yeah. end up in yeah. hospital, of course. Um, but, mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's just the reality of, of, you know, some of the substances. And then there's a lot of belief of like, oh, if we give them pharmaceutical grade, it'll be better. There's absolutely no data that somebody who's gone psychotic, uh, from meth will not go psychotic from, from, uh, a prescribed, uh, stimulant like Vyvanse or, uh, they become psychotic the same way. Once your brain goes down that path, it'll keep going down that path. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody starts with a prescribed stimulant so is the same thing like they're still going to go down that like <clears throat> no no the risk of of psychosis from a prescribed stimulant is much 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 lower okay. um it's it's once quite there, rare once you have a set point here right? yeah once so. you go psychotic yeah stimulants yeah. are out <laughs> they're okay. like uh, <laughs> yeah, stimulants and pot are a no-no and you know yeah. you talk to a lot of people who use meth and they don't use pot anymore and yeah. you almost guaranteed no that person goes psychotic well, I, I, know, I can tell you meth was the end of almost every drug except fentanyl, right? Like it took a right. lot of crack off the scene. It took a lot of, you know, all of it. And, sure it uh, and yeah, right. I can tell you right, from my personal experience myself, I, I hadn't had a drink since, yeah, right around the time I tried meth the first time. Right? It's the last time right. I had a drink, right? So, yeah. I feel yeah. like the things I see most commonly in the hospital that are causing psychosis is meth and cannabis. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because really? I feel like people are like, oh, cannabis is legal, cannabis is benign, cannabis is not a big deal. No. The problem is the THC content of the cannabis that people are using is like shockingly high. And, you know, I, I see way more cannabis induced psychosis since cannabis was legalized than what I is, ever saw before. Is there an aggravating factor to that? Though? Like, is it somebody who's already gone psychotic or, you know, or, or kind of hit that threshold? Are, are those the people that you're seeing as a result of cannabis? I just, that a lot so, of people I mean, have a hard time believing what you just said. Yeah. So I think what context, right? Like mm. what Rob was saying, right? I think that meth, 
the like if you take a group of people using meth, there's a higher proportion of them that are going to develop psychosis than if you take a group of people who are using cannabis. And yeah. we also know that if you develop psychosis on cannabis, you're more sensitive to psychosis. You're a higher risk individual to develop schizophrenia than if you become psychotic on meth. Because it's kind of like okay. almost everyone okay. who uses meth will become psychotic at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I just, I still, I wanted to say that because, you know, just yes. thinking about who the listeners are to the show. And again, people have this idea that cannabis is benign. And again, if you're right. 50 years old and you've been smoking weed on and off your whole life and you have never had psychosis, you're probably safe. But if you're 50 years old and you've got a kid or you're 40, and you've got a kid and your kid is using it and telling you it's fine, it's legal, it's benign, don't worry about it. Not true. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, right. right it's yeah. it's so know? factual. Look, all of this really comes down to actually access. So um, pot is really accessible right now. There's stores everywhere, as is alcohol. Um, so I, I uh, developed along with Dr. Monty Ghosh, the two of us developed and built the, the RAM clinic or the Rapid Access Addiction Medicine Clinic here in Calgary. Okay. This is now Alberta's largest addiction medicine program by far. Okay. Uh, last year, we serviced about 11,000 uh, patients in Calgary alone. We have a virtual RAM starting right away as well. Uh, for all of Alberta. But what's interesting is the majority of what we see is still alcohol and pot. And we, we have seen cannabis skyrocket. We have uh, protocols for cannabis detox and using a, a medication called Nabilone, which is like a synthetic THC to help people detox. And um, it is it is prominent in our addiction medicine clinics of treating cannabis addiction. Wow. That, that's just, so what I imagine then is if it's prominent to you now, at some point in the near or you know, subjective future, but the rest of us will start seeing it too. Because at, at you know, at my level is just a layman on the street. I've never even heard of such things until Lisa kind of mentioned it. You know, not that long ago, right? So, um, mm -hmm. certainly not the norm at this point. Yeah, we don't have a lot of prevention education. Mm -hmm. You know, all the things no. we said we were going to do with the money from cannabis sales. Uh, I don't know where any of that money went. But Rob, can I ask you about RAM? Um, so that's mm -hmm. interesting hearing you say that because I actually had a patient recently in hospital who, you know, had come in with a cannabis induced psychosis, um, cleared pretty quickly, super lovely guy, very motivated to stay off cannabis. And I tried to get the addiction team at the hospital I work at involved and yep. also had talked to them about helping connect him to RAM. And they told me that RAM is a medical addiction clinic and that they don't that cannabis patients do not go to ram and so they, well, that's, they that's wouldn't get involved purely, and i was like that's absolutely false first of all there's good medications okay. for treating cannabis addiction number one number two we have 30 counselors and um a nurse practitioner several nurses uh, and uh one uh, uh therapist we're we're hiring our second who focuses purely on trauma and trauma focused therapy with ART and EMDR. Um, we are an all inclusive program. Um, so unfortunately you were provided with quite simply uh, false information. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it makes no sense why, uh, I, I don't know what to say to that, but uh, we have more yeah. counselors there than anything else. Uh, RAM is adult addiction, adult addiction is RAM. We are the same thing in, in Calgary. Oh. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's that's good to know. I will take that back with me. And uh, yeah. this individual is still my patient at day hospitals, so I can, well, they can still come on make over. that happen. Look forward to seeing <laughs> yeah. him. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I do want to ask you about the Newly Institute as well. Um, yeah. Newly Institute. What's that? Um, I, I did do some reading on it, but if you just kind of want mm -hmm. to describe it, you, you'll do a much better job than I can. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, the Newly was kind of the culmination of everything I had learned in, in medicine uh, mm -hmm. and trying to build into treatment. So, you know, there's, there's great programs for treating veterans and, and police officers out there, but, you know, mm -hmm. I worked at one and I never understood why a template said we expect the person to be well and return to work in 18 months. Uh, I didn't understand why people would spend months with a patient seeing them weekly before they would do their first trauma session. Uh, none of it followed data, none of it followed any of the studies that were out there. I started inquiring and speaking to people in, in Europe, in the US, uh, prominent military psychiatrists who also disagreed with how we were doing things. Uh, and so I built something 
I, not I, there was, there was a group of us, but we, we built something that, that's very, very different. And it was based on, on really my desire to build something that makes sense. So it was about intensifying treatment. It was about no longer treating people like fragile uh, crystal, but rather uh, the resilient human beings that they are and, and need uh, treatment, not uh, back rubs and, and soft blankets. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we created. We created a, a world-class facility. Uh, you will not feel like you're in a medical clinic. You will not feel like you're in a WCB rehab program. Uh, it is, um, you know, top notch from the furnishings. We won a, a national award for the, uh, best design medical clinic in the country. Um, we, um, have some of the most robust uh, outcome data where two papers are being published right now, working with some University of Alberta uh, researchers and psychiatrists. Um, by employing everything that, that people with PTSD really need. So someone with PTSD often has a moral injury. So we had to add an acceptance commitment therapy to deal with that. Moral injury, can uh, you define that? Uh, a moral injury is... So let's say I'm a police officer and uh, in a shooting, I ended up shooting a child and that okay. child died. And I'm going to take that home with me like I did that. Gotcha. Uh, maybe I'm in the military and uh, I'm in a firefight and I'm being forced to keep fighting. Uh, it goes against everything I believe in. I can't shoot these people, but I, I did. Um, Maybe I've been sexually assaulted and abused uh, and it happened repeatedly, but there were physiological responses to it. It was my fault. I did that. That's where your moral injury comes from. And many, many people with trauma have a moral injury intermixed with it. So we needed to address those moral injuries. And with moral injuries, there's often a sense of injustice and anger. So we needed to approach that. Many people, if, if they've got chronic uh, trauma or or uh, complex PTSD, which North America likes to just ignore. Uh, most psychiatrists in North America have no idea what it is. Every other country in the world follow the ICD-11. It's a different diagnostic criteria, which includes complex PTSD. Uh, so if, if I've been traumatized many a times, usually as a child in an area where I can't get out of it, or I'm a first responder who's gone through trauma after trauma after trauma, uh, it starts to affect kind of our personality and, and how we do things, our skills, how we cope. So we added dialectical behavioral therapy as a, a really it's cognitive behavioral therapy on steroids. It's skills, skills, skills. Uh, we needed to teach mindfulness, how to just calm the system without taking drugs. Uh, so we incorporated significant amount of mindfulness. Uh, drumming, uh, artistic expression, things that you can really focus on being in the moment and being where you need to be at that time. So we wanted to build resiliency and long-term sequelae of recovery from trauma. Turns out my belief is this fits perfect for addiction. This picks, yeah. fits perfect for most of our mental health disorders. Very rarely do I meet someone with severe personality disorders or depression or anxiety that don't have trauma in their background? Uh, so we, we go to the root and that's, that's what I call it. This is the root of mental health is often uh, what we call adverse childhood experiences. We call them experiences. Some of those experiences are, are not experiences. Those are traumas, uh, except they're treatable. So we treat them. So uh, many programs and, and treatment facilities and, and quite simply uh, the way people approach mental health as experts, uh, adverse childhood experiences are a risk factor in Pandora's box. We don't open them. We just ask a few questions to get, uh, yes, they have four more adverse childhood experiences, so they have risks. We should never call them an experience. They're traumas and we should treat them as that. And that's what we do. So when an when a individual comes in through a disability, whether it's uh, Alberta Blue Cross or Sun Life or um, a WCB or Veteran Affairs Canada or RCMP, uh, we start with their earliest trauma. We build a trauma timeline and we deal with them all. And they may start doing trauma-focused therapy the first day they show up in clinic. We don't wait and we don't, oh, can you handle it? Or these are, these are resilient human beings who are, are living in hell in many cases uh, who need help and we need to start helping them. 
And so we, we took every bit of evidence around trauma, around addiction, around uh, trans diagnostic approaches to treating mental health, around functionality, and we built it into a single program. Wow. Wow. That's... Um... That's the newly. There's a long, <laughs> long monologue of what it is. But, and I uh, think, yeah. I think too, Sorry. Rob, like just to like add to that, and I haven't even been to newly, which is really sad. Yeah, I know. I got to get you over there. <laughs> yeah. Give you the tour, um, I know. But I think, you know, to speak to the fact that if you go there, right, you are seen by a psychiatrist, you have a thorough yes. psychiatric assessment, you're seen by a Everyone. psychologist, you have a neuropsychological Everyone. assessment done, your psychiatrist, your psychologist speak to one another to work on things. There's addiction physicians who are there. So it's, yes. you know, the number of, of different experts who are brought in to sort of holistically provide care to somebody is also, I think, very unique. Yes. We, we've done a lot of different things. So uh, nobody has an office. Everybody works in the same staff room. We chart in the same staff room. We have lunch in the same staff room. We do rounds in the same staff room. That's intentional because we have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers, psychologists, nurses, uh, primary care physicians, addiction medicine doctors, psychiatrists, all working together. And they're wow. learning from each other and seeing the person differently. The other thing that we do is a rotating model. So you won't see the same psychologist every time. You'll see a different therapist every time you're in clinic. Uh, that takes the onus off the therapist to get that person better. That removes the, the risk, not completely, but abates the risk quite a bit of, um, uh, of trauma from, from what you're doing or vicarious trauma being trans, dis, transposed onto the therapist themselves. Removes some of the pathological relationships of therapist asking for another 12 weeks or another 15 weeks. It is always the team. It is the team's job to get that individual well. Uh, it is not a person's job. And so it, it's made a huge difference. Now, there's been pushback and we've had some therapists not like it and, and uh, didn't work out working with us, but uh, the team that's there love it. And, yeah. and it really is about being in that team atmosphere and uh, that's a different process for a lot of uh, mental health clinicians who are often on a boat by themselves trying to figure their things out. And yeah, you, you picture any psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, and it's one person and a couch and a right. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's not about this this team environment. That's for sure, right? So yeah, yeah that's, that's called treating the walking well. But uh, we <laughs> treat really unwell people. Uh, there's no couches. Um, the the other part of it. I don't believe uh, good psychiatry in, in uh, mood disorders and trauma and anxiety disorders can do it without a team of therapists. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you're no different than any, anyone who can memorize uh, uh, a few algorithms and carry a prescription pad, which primary care can do that, nurse practitioners can do that, addiction medicine can do that, many, many practitioners can do that. Yeah. Uh, it's about you know, understanding the diagnosis, working with that individual, having a therapeutic approach, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trained in many different therapies. You know, we all get one that we get trained in, in, in residency. Um, but I've trained in many of the, the trauma focused therapies and in some of the group therapies like acceptance commitment therapy and DBT. And I don't necessarily practice it all the time, but I know the language every time. Yeah. So when, when a therapist, when they're seeing our therapy team and, you know, they come to me and we're having a meeting and they start talking about stuff. I can start throwing skills at them and terminology at them that everybody understands okay. rather than just like, oh, well, let me give you some advice. That's called supportive therapy and supportive therapy has no better data than sitting on a wait list. So there's no point. It's nice to be nice. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but we can do things much better than we do. Wow. The other thing with supportive therapy that I've found is it actually ends up being very discouraging for patients because what will happen is I'll see people in day hospital particularly, right, and they'll come in yeah. and we'll start to get a sense on like what their personality style is or what their, again, their traumas are, what sort of therapies they need. And then they'll say, well, you know, I just don't believe in therapy. I've been going to therapy for 10 years and like I yeah. still have the same issues I had 10 years ago. And then we'll kind of dig into, okay, like what kind of therapy were you doing and in most of those cases, it's supportive therapy. They went, they spoke to somebody, it felt good to say it out loud. They were, you know, a pat on the back, like, oh yeah, that's really hard. But they weren't taught skills, no specific modalities of therapy were utilized. And so patients actually get discouraged. I think it feels nice in the it's... moment, but over time, I think it's actually really damaging to just be doing supportive therapy. I, I just, just this past week, had a conversation with somebody very close to me out in, in Regina, who she 
um, you know, I'm just saying, hey, like I've learned a lot about, you know, some different things that are available to you and I might be able to help you kind of get that direction. And no, she, 10 years of it, I'm just saying, it's funny you said 10 years, 10 years of it, yeah. nothing's helped, nothing. I'm now yeah. I'm afraid to do it because it seems to get worse when it by every time. Right. And well, so that's she's the just, worst just part in, is... in her own hell now. Right. That's what right. Those so, people have spent yeah. 10 years paying for a friend and that friend bought a house and a car on their dime, uh, uh, but did uh, not get better. And right. even worse right. is the majority of, of that money that goes to those individuals doing uh, supportive therapy either comes from insurance companies, WCB companies, uh, all the things that drive rates up for all of us to keep on paying. Uh, and look, so th th there's always a dialectic, right? There's always two sides of the story. A therapist doing this kind of work all day, every day by themselves, it's hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's nice to have a few healthy patients that you get to talk to on Friday and try to balance your schedule yeah. so I don't have you know, patient A, B, and C uh, at the end of day Monday, because then I'm just never going to get home. They can only be here Tuesday morning when I have a different group here. And, you know, you start yeah. arranging yeah. yourself. When all of a sudden your entire caseload is difficult, that becomes hard. Mm -hmm. Supportive therapy is really easy. We just give advice and we're nice to people. Uh, yeah. Please. And then, and then we start backing that up with, can you read this mindfulness book? Can you check out this app? Can you uh, look at this. And then they say, well, I'm doing CBT or I'm doing mindfulness. Uh, the, it's, it's not true. It's a hard job being a therapist. And this is why having a team around you is so important. Because uh, mm -hmm. you need the support and you need the help. And you're going to be seeing really difficult stuff. Now, it's an easy job being a supportive therapist out in the community. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know what kind of outcomes you're going to be expecting. And it becomes what, what we call, and this is no disparaging to chiropractors, but it becomes a chiropractic model. We want to see you every week for the rest of your life. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And this, this isn't appropriate. No. no. Yeah. And therapy, I will say, like, I don't know how you, how you found it, Rob, but like for me, um, you know, I don't do a ton of therapy in my jobs. Um, but when I had to do therapy training through residency, I found it absolutely exhausting. Like I really found it <laughs> draining. Like, and I, it and is. there are, there are psychiatrists in the city who that's all they do. They don't prescribe, nice. they don't diagnose, they do therapy all day, every day. Um, and I like, I don't know how they do it. I mean, they always say different strokes for different folks. And I guess for some people that fuels them, but like, I just, I'm blown away by people like that. Cause I've, I personally it's... found doing you know, especially when you're doing hard, when you're working hard and you're really, you're not doing supportive, you're actually trying to, you know, teach skills and use skills and it's hard work. Oh man. Yeah, it, it is. So when we, I, I learned the hard way uh, and burnt myself out uh, by trying to run like a, a two man show, basically there was, there was me, uh, a fellow who continued with me afterwards. Uh, and uh, we had a great assistant who worked with us um, and a psychologist who I recruited from uh, uh, AHS who came and worked a little bit with us. But I was basically running the acceptance commitment therapy groups. I was doing all the opioid work, the deep prescribing. This was for a surgical program where I built their surgical pain program and we were tapering their opioids before surgery, which has much better outcomes. Uh, so we were we were doing some really hard work and, and I was basically leading it all. And it's a recipe for burnout. It's you can't, you can't be a one person show, it just doesn't work. And that's where I've really learned, you know, I, I've made a strong commitment to myself, I will never work outside of a team unless it's for assessments. Uh, I'll, I'll never ever do that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can so see that. If uh, if somebody's interested in, in, in you know, attending or I will, you know, being a client at the at the newly institute, uh, is it something they could do outside of insurance, or, or or do they need a referral? Is it it's private pay? What how? What are the options? You, you can no, you can private pay. Mm -hmm. um, we we it's it's a small subsection of of the program, but uh, there's a full stream of of private pay. Okay. Um, you can, if you're WCB, we only treat first responders. So. Okay. Um, you're not probably going to win that battle with WCB. Um, <laughs> if you're uh, in a long-term disability or short-term disability, uh, most of them will pay for it. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's it's mostly fully funded third party. 
Uh, but yep. there are a few people who have just given up on the system and, and come through uh, the program and can afford to do so. And, you know, by all means, uh, the ultimate goal uh, would be to create a system uh, that can do what the newly does and do it for free for everyone. Uh, yeah. But changing a system, <laughs> I've learned also some hard lessons yeah. in that as well. I can imagine. I can imagine. It, yes. it sounds like you're, you're maybe in a position to actually start affecting some sort of change, you know, or at least influencing some of it now. And I think uh, you've earned your way to that to that part. Yeah, and I think the RAM clinic is doing a lot of it. Um, we've mm -hmm. really tried to focus on uh, treating the root of the addiction, working on doing some trauma work. Uh, we're excited to be hiring our our second uh, full time trauma therapist. Uh, and, and I mean, like, it's really cool to have a therapist who all they do is trauma therapy. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, uh, something that doesn't exist in, in most of Alberta, um, yeah. and, uh, really focusing on the root. So a lot of what I've tried to do at, at newly, I had already been trying to get going at Ram. It just took us a long time to get funding at Ram. Yeah. Um, and now, um, I still, uh, work at the Ram clinic and, uh, I'm there right now a day a week, but starting in September, I'll be there two days a week. And, um, it's, it's a great program and anybody can go there. There's no charge. Okay. We actually have a, a friend of the show. One of our, one of our sponsors, uh, the Yacht treatment center out in uh, Phuket, Thailand, uh, Mike Miller, oh. uh, full-time trauma therapist. That's uh, where addictions to smoke trauma is the fire, right? Uh, right? Mike's come on the show now. Oh, geez. Two or three times, I guess. Hey, uh, hell of yeah. a guy hell of a guy right yeah he, he might be listening right now actually he's one of the people i gave the live link to so yeah right uh, well, i think it's actually great. interesting he does more emdr um yeah that's that's his definitely his specialty yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what's your yeah, take EMDR's like great. on the on the difference or like is there a yeah. time you do art versus emdr or yeah so we we uh allow our therapists to decide which modality it's almost invariably always emdr art uh, one of the two. Remember, ART is just a manualized breakoff of EMDR. They're very similar. So I, um, I want to pause on that, if, if you yes, don't mind. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Terminology. <laughs> well, fair enough. Um, when Mike first came on the show with Lisa, um, yeah. we tried to kind of have that conversation about the difference, but it never really, we never really did, uh, you know, clear yeah, that up. Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not trained in either, and so I was more asking right. Mike, and of course, Mike's yeah. not trained in yeah. ART, and so yeah. we were sort of two yeah. people lost in the dark, but just recognizing yeah, it was kind of awkward, that you hear about Lisa them. I was coming into it with this, this information about it, so I thought, you know, I was like, oh my yeah. god, right? And actually, we changed the format of the show that weekend. That that's when I decided that there's a real appetite for this, and even though I never got the answers yeah. I was looking for. So right. here's your chance, yeah. Rob, to kind of clear that up for us. What are what's the, sure. the you know fundamental so, differences? Look, there's there's three um, kind of well the the gold standard for for trauma focused therapy is prolonged exposure PE. Okay. So prolonged exposure um, is basically you you go in you see your therapist for an hour and a half a week. In that time, uh, you'll work on the traumas, build a trauma timeline, and then pick your traumas and start going through them. And so you pick one specific trauma. And then you're going to remember it and the therapist is going to help you go through the memories of it. Uh, you got to use a lot of skills to restabilize and ground yourself because it's quite destabilizing talking about, but they want every little specific about it. Then what you're going to do when they got the story is you're going to record it and then you're going to listen to it every day. Nope. And then you're going to come back the next week and do it again. And the next week and do it again. And the next mm -hmm. week and do it again. So you have about, um, a, a 40 to 50% dropout rate in studies makes mm -hmm. sense, right? Yep. <laughs> and uh, when you look at, at outcome data, it's about the one third, one third, one third, uh, clinically what we see in real life. Yep. One third of people get better. One third mm -hmm. of people, not much. And one third of people get worse. So uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. a tough process. It's also really hard. Like even the first time I actually had been triggered, uh, and, and understanding what a, a trauma trigger was, was going through prolonged exposure training and uh, some really horrific stories that you have to process with a patient, da, da, da. And, and I got triggered at a coffee shop by something that reminded me of that patient's trauma. Uh, and it was just shocking how it like blew into my head. And I was like, holy cow, so this is what people go through all the time. Um, so prolonged exposure, the gold standard. Um, it's got good data also under uh, Edna Foa, who's uh, really led uh, prolonged exposure in the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Uh, you don't have to wait for someone to be sober to do it. 
Uh, that's the key. Uh, the second one is cognitive processing therapy. So prolonged exposure is a form of CBT. But when someone says you can do CBT for PTSD, that's false. You need to do a specific form of it. So one of it is called prolonged exposure. One is cognitive processing therapy. So this is a lot like CBT. You're going to get a manual. You're going to get homework every day. You're going to be plowing through homework. Uh, and, and it's about changing, you know, reframing, as Lisa had mentioned, changing how you, you think about your trauma and you respond to the triggers of the trauma itself. So cognitive processing therapy, excellent outcome data. It's the only one that you can do in group. Um, but a really pivotal study compared one-on-one -on -one individual cognitive processing therapy versus group cro uh, cognitive processing therapy, and individual is phenomenally better. Um, the next one is EMDR. This is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. This is kind of the voodoo of the three. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's... The concept really comes down to going into the memory where REM is, is, so when we sleep, we go into REM sleep or rapid eye movement. This is where we believe memory becomes stored. So the goal is to try to replicate a bit of REM. Uh, now, there's many, many different theories here. This is just one of the theories. So don't, uh, don't sound like this is the absolute, but uh, to kind of go into REM and to change how you see that memory. So it's kind of like changing the cover of a book. The books, you can't change a memory. The memory is still there, but the way you see the memory differs by changing the cover. And, and that's kind of the, the concept. Now, ART takes it to one step further and really says, here's your memory. How are we going to change it? Uh, and so ac that's accelerated resolution therapy. Okay. And so you're literally helping someone change the cover. Now, a lot of people believe EMDR is still a form of exposure because you're, you're still talking about your, your trauma. ART is fascinating because you actually don't have to talk about your trauma. Which is the way it, EMDR was explained to me too. Well, so you, 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 so look, uh, most good EMDR or, therapists right? will bring in some exposure to it. Um, yeah. Some of the best that I've worked with are OSI uh, ones that, you know, they, if you've got a, an aversion to a smell, which I don't want to go too deep into it, but a lot of military people have a lot of smells that they can't cope with. They will bring the smell into the EMDR session. They will. So there, there's, you know, the more intensive EMDR therapist, uh, you know, they start to bring in uh, a lot of the, the other areas. When we, when we developed the newly, uh, a lot of what we do is with first responders and we'll do our occupational therapists will bring them to the site of the trauma or to the workplace. Okay. Now that's a, that's a significant exposure, a flooding sort of exercise. Now we don't do that first day, right? Uh, but <laughs> that's part of the return to work process. There's a really good study uh, out of the Netherlands. And, and this is where a lot of the EMDR studies come from is, is Europe. Uh, and what they did is they, they, did a day of EMDR and PE together. So in one group, they got EMDR in the morning and then they did prolonged exposure in the afternoon. In the other group, they did prolonged exposure in the morning and EMDR in the afternoon. The group that did EMDR in the afternoon did significantly better. And that's because okay. EMDR is a stabilizing type of therapy like ART. Prolonged exposure is a destabilizing, leading into stabilizing type of therapy. Break them down and build them up kind of thing. Correct. Right. So what, most of yeah. what, that it, there's truth to it, but it, it really is, we're going to open yourself wide open yeah. and then keep you open for a long period of time. Whereas EMDR is trying to <laughs> kind of trick you into to wellness, so to speak, and it, and it works. Uh, the best part mm -hmm. about EMDR, you have lower dropout rates, so much mm -hmm. higher retention rates. So okay. what we decided to do, if, if our OTs are bringing someone to the work site, they'll always come back and offer an EMDR ART session as a stabilizing type of, of therapy. Okay. And that's been a remarkable shift for people. So we're not sending people home. We, we would have at the OSI, our CMP officers saying, yeah, I sit in the parking lot and cry for an hour before I go home. Like what, what kind of therapy is that? It's, <laughs> it's terrible. So we, we really tried to develop protocols and programs that are supportive to that individual, but are evidence-based and intense. So that, that's how to break it up. Now, ART is just a manualized break off, but you don't have to speak about your trauma at all. You okay. can just think about it and then go through the cycle. 
Uh, EMDR really, as you get into the more intensive EMDR training, um, mm -hmm. It, it really starts bringing in more and more of the uh, exposure stuff to it. And okay. uh, I, I would say of all of them, EMDR is probably the most advanced, uh, the most able to kind of work all different scenarios. A, the best therapist that you're going to see is trained in all of them, period. They should Which be trained in all of them. If you're doing all yeah. this, you yeah. should be a PE expert. You should be a CPT mm -hmm. expert. You should be an EMDR expert. And then the nice thing about ART at a systemic level, I can train nurses in ART. I can train addiction counselors in ART. I can treat therapists in ART. You can't do that with the MDR, PE. Uh, most of those, you either need to be a physician or a master's or PhD leveled psychologist or social worker. Um, so, yep. you know, you simply can't do the training for it unless you're that. But ART, you know, any healthcare worker with a professional college can do it, which is awesome. So it from a system opens a lot level, of doors, I right? want to train yeah. everyone yeah. on ART. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so. so hopefully I, that helps. There's one last one is trauma-focused CBT, but that's for children and adolescents only. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's okay. TFCBT. Uh, what you're saying about pro prolonged exposure, I, I mean, sitting here now, I... I, I <laughs> there was a yeah. second there. I was it's like, intense. Yeah. no, right? <laughs> like, I feel like I could yeah. like see your heart, your heart you beat go up as he was talking yeah. about that. I still have some pretty unresolved stuff, Rob. So you're right, you know. Um, I guess sitting there, I was just like, no, no, right? That's not going to happen. So <laughs> it's, I, 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 I get it. I, I do. Right? Yeah. And yeah. you know what's interesting is now, does does the use of psychedelics improve uh, our response to trauma focused therapy? You just you did uh, it again. That's you know, what we're learning to be here, Rob. That was my next. Lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about psychedelics. So, um, and, and at least touch on that. Anyway, um, one of my one of my colleagues over there, um, uh, Daniel Unmanageable at the Hard Knocks Talk Show. Yeah, uh, just I know him. A couple, oh, you you know of Dan? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah a I couple do. weeks yeah. ago, he did the psychedelic uh, uh, thing, their trip, you uh, know, or whatever. I'm aware. Um, completely changed him. As you know, mm -hmm. at least for the, when I first saw him, maybe you know, less than a week later, later or whatever, online. I'm, Man, you're a different guy. Right? You're a different guy altogether. So yeah. um, what, what are your thoughts on that? And, and is, is that something you offer as well? Or what, you know, uh, it so it, it is a, a small piece at the New Lee that, that is offered. Uh, it, it all has to go through. Um, so look, there's underground psychedelics. I I'm, have nothing to do with that. Of course. And then there's uh, uh, kind of taking the special access program through Health Canada, getting the approvals. Um, yeah. so we, we have done a few of those, mostly end of life care okay, and dealing with the existential crisis of death, which who doesn't deal with that? Um, yeah. in my opinion, um, probably in, in 10 years, everyone in hospice and palliative care will be offered it. Um, yeah. with regards to, to treatment resistant depression, which is usually just trauma that's not been diagnosed well, uh, and in PTSD, um, we see the ability. So what, what things like ketamine, uh, and psilocybin, I don't have much experience with MDMA. Um, although that's now becoming available as well for us. Um, what they do is they, they turn off the autonomic nervous system that's leading to the panic attacks autonomic. Uh, to them. Yeah. It's, it's your, your fight or flight system. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, most people with PTSD are just stuck in 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 fight or flight. There's mm -hmm. no rest and digest for them. They're just yeah. ongoing, going, going, going. And this turns it off like that. Uh, a ketamine yeah. treatment can shut that down. Um, it turns off the panic attacks. It turns off the intrusive thoughts. It turns off the the suicidal thinking. It's most powerful anti suicidal stuff out there. Uh, okay. it, it's got some great, great opportunities and purposes that need a bit more research. Ketamine is often linked as a, a psychedelic. It's not, uh, it's a dissociative anesthetic that has powerful, uh, antidepressant, anti, uh, anxiolytic or anxiolytic and, and anti-suicidal effects. Uh, personally, I, I believe, uh, the emergency departments will all be using ketamine. Many are already in Canada using them. Uh, and it'll be, you come in suicidal, you'll get ketamine treatment and, uh, the problem is there's no follow-up after, but that's a, that's a whole different story. <laughs> but uh, I, I have no doubt that what these truly are, um, are enzymatic processes. They're, they're, they speed up uh, the treatment. They, they make therapy. So what do we do? We take someone really, really unwell and we throw them in group. 
Yeah. They can't concentrate on group. They can't focus. <laughs> they're they're worried about what everybody else is thinking. They're having little mini panic attacks, not a full blown yeah. one, and they leave. I, Even I'm worse, this crap with myself. Never mind a room full of people. There right you there. go. <laughs> Even worse, they're doing it online. So they're sitting at home and they just like yeah. screw it, black out the screen. Yeah. I'm going to have a drink or I'm going to yeah. go do something else. And supposedly I'm in treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I really think what it does is it, it speeds up the process. It stabilizes someone physiologically in a biological process in order to move forward with really good therapy. Remember all the data for like maps, includes, uh, I think 26 hours of therapy. So wow. if you were to look at what 26 hours of therapy is, that's one year at an hour a week, right? Yeah. Yeah. Half hour. So, and you're jamming it into a couple yeah. of months. It's a lot of yeah. like what we're doing in, in our intensive programming. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a lot of therapy. Um, there, there's not a lot of data for just kind of one-off treatments and no, 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 no. Ayahuasca is an interesting thing that we don't have a lot of data on, but uh, everyone will tell you it changes their life. But yeah. these are the kind of things that we need to bring this experiential understanding into medical uh, treatment algorithms. And, yeah. and that's a bit of a passion of mine, but it's, it's really hard to do. Um, that's a battle, I imagine. Right? It, yeah. Well, yeah. It's hard to get funding on on some of this. Now, initially, everybody and their dog opened a, a mushroom company, so they were everywhere. Most of them are bankrupt now. Uh, so there was money flowing for a while, but you know, it's it's going to be an interesting process. And what what's most exciting is that psychedelics are going to be a new tool for psychiatry and addiction medicine in a world where we haven't had a lot of new tools uh, in a yeah. long, long time. So no kidding, it's eh? exciting. No kidding. Wow. Well. Wow. Well, um, doctor, I could, I could sit here and talk to you for hours. Yeah, <laughs> definitely one of the, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the more comprehensive guests I've had. Jesus, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Um, I do want to dig more into the, um, uh, mandated treatment bit here. Mm. Uh, we kind of touched base on it and I'm, I'm not sure how we, we verged off of it, but you know, it is kind of a thing right now in Alberta, right? So, um, you can only talk so much about it, though. I'm not even sure what I'm allowed to ask you for crying out loud. Right. So, you know, what I can say is drug policy is a, a major part of this, right? And, mm -hmm. and how do we approach the current issues that we're seeing today, whether it's social disorder, violent crime, um, uh, toxic overdoses, um, uh, the significant rise in alcohol and uh, drug related injuries leading to hospitalizations? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's all of this, right? It's, it's not, and, and of course, everybody has a simple, easy answer, right? Just give them safe supply and the world's <laughs> cured. Uh, yeah, but yeah. we've, we've seen this several times, right? Everybody gets a naloxone kit and will never have an overdose. Well, that didn't quite work. And we, we hand out a lot of naloxone kits and we should yeah. not stop. It's yeah. very good. Probably yeah. the most powerful harm reduction. That's thing a we great have. time for a PSA. Just, we'll be right back. <laughs> now for a quick public service announcement. One of the best ways to reduce stigma is with education. If you still have questions that we haven't answered on today's show, you can learn more about Together We Can's education group at twcrecoverylife.org. Hi, everybody. This is Carl with today's public service announcement about naloxone, or as it's more commonly known, Narcan, a medication that can help save the life of somebody experiencing an opioid overdose. Did you know that in 2021, opioids were responsible for over 7,000 deaths in Canada? and 106,000 deaths in the United States. These numbers are staggering, but there is hope. Narcan is a medication that can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose and help save a life. Narcan is available for free at participating pharmacies and harm reduction centers across Canada and is also available without a prescription at most pharmacies in the United States. Now I know most of you won't be around people using opioids, but you never know when it will be around you and you could save the life of someone who is loved and who loves? I right. love it. No, yeah, it's yeah, it's right. really important. I got one in my backpack. I got a, a nasal one in my briefcase. Um, everybody talk, should have right? them, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So then we thought, yeah. okay, uh, Suboxone. Suboxone will be the answer to everything. Uh, and yep. Suboxone's a great medication, the best protective medication to prevent overdose, bar none. Um, yeah. And so, uh, a great medication, but simple, easy answers aren't the answer. Then it's just going to be safe consumption sites. Then it's going to be safe supply. Then it's going to be 
treatment access to everyone. Then it's going to be everybody's got a, a plan. The answer is it's all of it. Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. when I hear someone saying treatment doesn't work, it's got to be harm reduction. That's not correct. When I see yeah. someone saying harm reduction doesn't work, it's got to be treatment. That's not correct. Yeah. Um, to, to give you an idea, in, in Alberta, there are 6,650 people living without a home. 6,650. Mm -hmm. We, we got to talk about housing as part of this process too. Yeah, so yeah. of that, uh, approximately 40 to 70% of those individuals are using substances. So guesstimation mm -hmm. half. Yeah. Of that, uh, about 30%, no, 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 not of that, that's just one subset. Of the 6,650, 30% have okay. a mild traumatic brain injury. Okay. Uh, sorry, 30% have a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. A moderate mm -hmm. to severe traumatic brain injury often requires uh, significant supports around an individual. Mm -hmm. These people are living on the streets with no supports. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's, that's about 2,000 people living on the streets with a moderate to severe brain injury. About 25% of these people, one in four, are living with untreated schizophrenia. So when we talk yeah. about drug policy and we talk about you know, mandated treatment being a part of it, what are we gonna do with all of these individuals? So our, our policies for a long time was deinstitutionalize. Has that been the right thing? All the data shows when you close a mental health institution, you fill a jail and the rest end up on the street. So we tried to fix it with group homes. I think anyone who's worked in, in mental health can talk about some of the difficulties with group homes. Great people really trying really hard to help people, but it's not enough. Yeah. And, and so we, we have major issues there. And, and where are most of the politics right now? Uh, the premier of BC talked about mandated treatment long before Alberta did. The mayor of New York talked about mandated treatment before Alberta did. Alberta then started talking about mandated treatment. But are we talking about mandated treatment in the setting of uh, social disorder and violence on our LRTs or, or C trains or whatever, public transportation? You know, I was talking to a bunch of downtown workers in Edmonton who are like, I don't take the LRT anymore. Like, it's just not an option yeah. uh, <laughs> unless I can get on exactly at four o'clock when it's full and I yeah. can get off at that time. Otherwise, like I'm not using it at night. I'm not using it. It's, it's dangerous. And, and the data s supports that. So we, we've got this social disorder thing. So if we're talking about treating social disorder um, and, and we're talking about probably mostly methamphetamine, somebody uses fentanyl, they're not a very aggressive person. They're usually fairly subdued and, and quiet, but meth is quite the opposite. Uh, and people who go psychotic one and two uh, often paranoid. Um, and so look, they're, they're not dangerous or evil people. They're influenced by a substance that's leading to harm. Yeah. What are we going to do with all these individuals? There's no easy answer. So we can say, well, we're going to crank up treatment. We've done that in Alberta better than anyone. We have, we have access to treatment better than almost anyone. Not so good for pediatrics, not so good for geriatrics, but for the general adult population struggling with uh, uh, alcohol or, or cannabis or gambling, like we're great. Meth, uh, they need a longer period of time. We're building these now one year programs that, that will be great for meth. Opioids, we have the best access to opioid agonist therapy in the country. We have the virtual opioid dependency program. We have the only network of publicly funded opioid dependency programs run under Alberta Health Services. Uh, we have a bunch of the little private ones out there as well. Um, we have the only network of emergency uh, uh, programs. So every emergency department in Alberta has been trained on initiating buprenorphine, naloxone, or suboxone. Um, we were the first province to, to fund a sublocate, the once a month injection. Um, now, it, it's transformational time takes time. We're the first province to provide uh, injectable opioid agonist therapy to the entire province through the narcotic transition service. Are there problems with it? Of course, everybody wants access everywhere. But yeah, yeah. when I started prescribing methadone and Suboxone, if I would have sent him to Safeway, it would not have gone well. No offense to Safeway. <laughs> if I would have sent him to any yeah. major big pharmacy, pharmacy. Yeah, they'd have course. been like, no, 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 we don't, we don't treat that. Now they all no, do. No. All yeah. of them. Yeah. 
Really, if eh? I were right. to send yep. somebody with a prescription for heroin uh, mm -hmm. to a large uh, uh, pharmacy with no experience, that's not going to get done there. No. So no. it's going to take time for the pharmacies to catch up, but they will. And eventually, these kind of programs will be accessible to everyone as well. Okay. But we're the only one who's doing it at a provincial level, not a center of excellence level, a small clinic in a small subset of a small population, but the yeah. whole population. Yeah. But it is taking time. So we've got lots of great stuff, yet we see our overdoses continuing to climb back up again. Yeah. We need yeah. to work a bit more on some of the harm reduction processes. In, in my opinion, we need to medicalize uh, the, the, um, the consumption sites. You mm -hmm. want the so-called, we can call it safer supply or whatever. Pharmaceutical grade uh, substances to, to uh, take over for illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. The best place mm -hmm. to do it is inside of an SCS under the guise of a physician where it cannot be taken out of there, where there is no diversion. So now you re remove diversion, which is one of the biggest issues around safe supply right now that everybody's talking about. Yep. You re remove the drug dealer. So you remove a lot of the social uh, issues that can come and uh, the problems of, of uh, consumption sites, especially when centralized. Um, mm -hmm. And you start creating relationships with healthcare teams that are recovery orientated where you can start talking to that individual where, you know, you deserve what everyone else deserves. You deserve love, you deserve a home, you deserve a car, you deserve a job, you deserve everything. Absolutely. And there's a way that you can get that and I can help you with that if and when you want it. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that for a second. Yep. Again, there's a, there's a big Lisa moment here, right? When, when, when she had said to me, well, to her harm reduction is a chance for, for connection. And, and it, it, that was, a, it was another one of those for me, aha moments where, mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Whatever, whatever your thoughts are on, on all the little parts of harm reduction. It, yeah, it's an opportunity for connection and, and for, you know, to somebody to, to start getting, having those conversations. And I think they're pretty right. powerful. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And, and you can't mandate treatment till all of this is available until you mm -hmm. have access voluntarily on demand for everything. Yeah. You, you can't mandate people into something that they didn't have access to in the first place. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. if we're going to mandate, let's say we decide we're going to mandate, uh, you know, uh, individuals who are living without a home, uh, who are causing safety concerns to the community. However, you want to look at that. There's many ways you can look at it. Uh, we're talking about thousands of people. Where are we going to put them? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, a lot of this becomes a moot point there's at, at the same time, we've talked about the mental health part. I a hundred percent agree. We should be doing something similar. I think it's nothing more than stigma that we allow someone to, um, continue to use a toxic drug that can kill them at any given moment, uh, to continue to put themselves into a psychotic, uh, episode with, without any treatment. Uh, but we wouldn't allow them to jump off a bridge and we wouldn't allow them if they had primary schizophrenia to live that way. We'd talk about stigma. They sit and emerge, they clear, oh, you don't have schizophrenia, you're out of here. Oh, you do have schizophrenia, we're going to treat you. Like, yeah. What? What? Yeah. What, yeah, right. what is, what is, that's ridiculous. So there's so many layers that it's easy for people to catastrophize that we're just going to throw them all in jail. Well, simply, we don't have room in jail to do that. Yeah. Uh, it's easy for people to catastrophize that we're going to take everybody's rights away. So somebody gets caught drinking on the street and we're going to lock them into a one-year treatment center. That's insane. We, how <laughs> could you do that? You would have to spend billions of dollars building yeah. hospitals dedicated to this all over the province. That's insane. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's going to, I, I mean, it's probably coming because the, the premier and deputy premier and, and ministers are out there talking about it all the time. So I, I assume it's coming. BC is looking into it. Um, other states all over the U.S. are looking into it. I just joined um, an advisory group in Oregon, and they're discussing it. It's happening everywhere. Uh, the question is, who's going to put up the money to make it viable? Yeah. And this isn't a $10 million job. This isn't a $100 million job. This is a multi-billion dollar yeah, process. Yeah. I, I think yeah, even Rob, I remember level, billions of dollars, right? Yeah. I remember um, a few years ago, and I haven't looked at it more recently, but 
I remember looking at studies that had been done, I believe in the US, the UK, maybe Australia as well, but where they've looked at sort of the cost of treating people with addiction versus the cost of not treating. And so the cost oh, of yeah. not treating is, you know, crimes, hospitalizations, and so every six, single one of mm -hmm. those studies, it was, it ranged between every dollar spent save six to every dollar spent save 10. It was like somewhere in that range. And that's also <laughs> always kind of stood out to me. I mean, somebody was saying, well, the reason politicians don't really care is because they're only there for four years and this is going to take more than four years. But like economically, it, like it makes sense to be building these facilities, having these beds, doing this work, like it, it will save money. Correct. Yeah. That's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> there, there's, there's, we, we absolutely know. In fact, yeah. the whole reason of community treatment orders in schizophrenia is that untreated schizophrenia has a much worse prognosis and outcome than treated. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the whole purpose. We need to keep someone treated or it's going to be devastating. And, and uh, eventually, if we and force treatment that's non-voluntary, it has to be because they're at risk of harming others. But all of them coercively sign voluntarily. And just um, interject, just Rob, just yeah. because a lot of people won't know what a community treatment order is. But right. So if we have someone in the hospital with schizophrenia, we'll stabilize them in hospital. And then if there's, for example, um, a history of harm to self, harm to others, history of medication noncompliance, and so relapse of their psychosis, then what we can do is put them on what Rob's talking about, which is a community treatment order. So what that means is that there's, it's two physicians need to um, sign on to do it. It needs to be overseen by a physician in the community. And so this patient is mandated to take their treatment. We usually try to do it with injection, but you can do it with oral medication. And so if that person does not show up to get their medication or does not cooperate with visibly being seen to take their oral medication, police will bring them into hospital. Now in hospital, what'll happen is they'll be seen by psychiatrists, they'll be assessed. If it hasn't been that long since they missed their medication and they're still stable, then they'll have the option of receiving the medication in hospital and being sent home. Um, if on the other hand, sometimes it takes a while to track these folks down. If by the time they're being seen, they're unstable again, then it could warrant a readmission to hospital for restabilization. But yeah, basically yes. it's a way of mandating ongoing treatment um, once they've been discharged back to the community. Right. Yeah, yeah. On well, the I, basis. Saskatchewan, that's a CPO, a community protection order. I think, yeah, I think. Could be. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't yeah. know for sure. Yeah. It's all on the basis mm -hmm. that if we don't treat that individual, they will get worse and worse and worse and their prognosis gets worse. Guess what? Untreated <laughs> addiction has a horrible prognosis. Say, there's another box check. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> you know, um, at the same time, you know, some people will argue 80% of people uh, who struggle with addiction uh, stop on their own accord. Now, that's a, a really, it's a wonky number based on uh, mm -hmm. some telephone survey stuff on alcohol specifically. Uh, we don't really know. That's, mm -hmm. that's the reality of what we sit at is we don't know. But what we do know is that when individuals start on opioid agonist treatment, their risk of death significantly reduces. Okay. What we do know is that if somebody's not using fentanyl, their risk of death is much, much lower than someone <laughs> who is. And what we do know yeah. is that the number one cause of death for individuals between 18 and I believe 40 in Canada is a drug overdose. In British Columbia, it is now anyone between, I believe the age of 10 and 60, are 10 and 50. Uh, it's, it's horrific. It's horrific. Awful. And, it's and awful. doing nothing is not the right answer. No. And, and that's, that's why I have a, a lot of love for, for the harm reduction community, because they agree with that doing nothing is stupid. We yeah. have to do something. And the answer is we need harm reduction. We need to medicalize some of it. Uh, we need access points, as, as Lisa had stated, that it's, a, it's an access point to treatment is what harm reduction is. It's a, the first connection many people will be making. The hospital is yeah. not a good place for many people struggling with addiction. It's highly stigmatized. The eMERGE is not a, a soft, comfortable landing for many people. So harm reduction facilities, we can learn so much from the non-judgmental approach, the kindness that's being put across. Uh, it's sad that we have to teach our healthcare system how to be kind and nice, but uh, well, it turns out you, we probably if do. I can, if I can interrupt with a, just a, a real quick personal story. Um, I was injecting meth at the time. It was my drug of choice. Very short-lived thing for me. It's at the end of my drug career, if you want to call it that. 
um, in Regina, uh, ended up with an abscess, went to the emergency room. Outside of the extreme violence, the most traumatic thing I've ever faced. Hands down. It was the it was the most awful, awful experience. Um, that this the the triage nurse at the top of her lungs. You know, when's the last time you injected crystal meth and like, Fuck's sakes, right? Like, there's, there's a whole you know everybody in the everybody in the waiting room here. Three and a half hours later, I left untreated. After they stuck me in the secure room in the in the ER and uh, you know treated me like a, like I was there like a prisoner or something like that, right? You know, yeah. And three and a half hours later, I just got up and left, right? So that, yeah. that's how that ended. It was horrible. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm really yes, sorry sir. that happened, and I, I oh, think okay. it happens to a lot of people. I'm a normal looking white guy. I can't imagine how that feels for somebody that's already hypersensitive to being, sure, you know, stereotyped and stigmatized. Yeah. I, I just, oh, it'd be just the most mm-hmm. horrific experience. So, yeah. um, can I ask you a question about OAT, Rob? Um, mm-hmm. So I remember a while back at one of the journal clubs, we had reviewed um, papers and it was sort of looking at if somebody has an opiate addiction, they're put on some form of OAT. Um, I think at the time what the evidence was showing, and this would have been maybe six years ago now, but it was showing that even five years, 10 years into sobriety, they had a very high relapse rate if they were taken off any form of OAT. I'm just curious, do you know, like, what it, what does it say now? Like, if, you're, if you yeah. have it, you get onto OAT, you achieve sobriety on OAT, is the recommendation to come off it at some point, to stay on it indefinitely, or? There, there's no recommendations right now. The okay. recommendation is if you and the the uh, patient in front of you, if the two of you decide that maybe it's time to start tapering, you do it slowly over a long period of time. That's there's okay. your entire guideline recommendation right there because we don't know. Okay. Um, the data clearly shows that if you detox people, uh, their risk of overdose cranks up. The data clearly shows that um, that OAT is protective, supportive, and and highly beneficial to people with opioid uh, opioid use disorder or opioid addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, what what we don't know too much about is what happens after stabilization. But what we do know, this is the Optima trial. This was a multi million dollar trial done in Canada, the largest of its kind. What we do know is the vast majority of people, 60 to 70% of people will drop out of OAT within the first uh, three to six months. Hmm. That is devastating. And are they relapsing back to use or do we know? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. They just quit coming to clinic. That's what we know. I I, I think it'd be a safe assumption that, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it could be, right? could be, or maybe they just stop on their own accord and say, I'm not going to be tied to this pharmacy anymore. And I'm not going to have a ball and chain following me around everywhere. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to, hard to know exactly, but what we do know is that simply prescribing a medication in and of itself is not enough. Mm. And that has been the Canadian model. The American model is not that the majority of people in the U S will get addiction counseling and therapy. Uh, the majority of, of people in Canada, We'll get a prescription and be seen every three months. Yeah. So I, I challenge everyone uh, to the concept of can you change somebody's life in 15 minutes every three months or one hour a year? Not a two individuals in my life have been capable of it, but that's a pretty yeah, rare it's, thing. It's, right? it's, yeah. it's yeah. just yeah. right. Like, you know, you're, yeah. you're really relying on that person saying, no, I want to come in more. I want more help. I want to do something. I got to do it. Now, here's the best study. It's out of Boston, out of Massachusetts, and they looked at risk of overdose death after detox from opioids. Mm -hmm. So highest risk is detox and nothing. Huge risk of death. Second highest risk, or or now to reduce the risk from that. uh, Now, interesting, the detox may be still lower than continued use, but we we don't know really, but the risk is high. Then from there, um, it's, it's inpatient treatment center. So you go into inpatient treatment or residential treatment. I don't like using the word residential for many reasons. Uh, so inpatient treatment center. So you do inpatient addiction treatment. You drop the risk by uh, 20, 30%. It's a good drop. Then, uh, medications for opioid use disorder, which is a new terminology being thrown around a lot mode or OAT opioid agonist there, suboxone methadone. 
significantly reduces it again, 50-60%. The biggest reduction was when you combine the two, inpatient treatment with opioid agonist therapy, where you had almost a 90% reduction in risk of death. Incredible. Wow. Wow. And we still have the majority of our inpatient centers in Canada not prescribing OAT. Where's the, is there a logic to that or, or is that just no logic those? ideology no. nothing more a lack of regulations forcing all of them to have addiction medicine they're working now that has shifted over the years the majority that get provincial funding do have uh, opioid agonist treatment as part of it many of them will just use outpatient clinics and send them over there uh, but it, it is an absolute necessity that we combine good treatment addiction medicine addiction therapy uh, psychiatric care, trauma therapy, all of it, all of it combined together in one way or another. Ultimately, it's in one facility. And, um, you know, there's a great study out of the UK that was published in The Lancet, so fairly reputable, I think. Um, and what it showed is that individuals who weren't uh, stabilizing on methadone or suboxone, when added individualized therapy, had a significantly increased response to treatment, i.e. Uh, a majority of those individuals ended up stabilizing just by adding therapy. Wow. So wow. you wonder what would happen if all of our Canadian institutions all had therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists working within them, rather than just a prescriber model, which in many cases is a for-profit model. Mm -hmm. That there was that. So. Yeah. Um, Rob, can I ask you another question? Um, we had somebody on the show from the US who was talking about naltrexone for opiate use disorder. Uh -huh. So my understanding is that it sort of blocks receptors, but it doesn't decrease cravings. Um, and so that's the reason that we don't tend to use it in Canada for opiate use disorder. Uh -huh. But so what's the reason? Why don't we use it? So it's two things. One proponent of that. Yeah. Right. There's two forms of naltrexone. There's oral. Okay. We have that yeah. in Canada. Mm -hmm. There's IM depot medication, a once a month injection. We don't have that in Canada. Mm -hmm. That has as good of evidence. In fact, it has inferiority studies to show as good as taking Suboxone. Wow. No wow. difference in cravings. No difference in anything else. It absolutely works. And we don't we have, just it don't have it in Canada. Just because so what about the oral? Yet, Why or? don't we use the oral? Like, we so don't, similar, I don't ever see it used for alcohol. I don't see it used for yeah. opiates. Yeah. So similar to, to um, uh, uh, what's it called? Disulfiram, antabuse for alcohol. Mm -hmm. You just stop using it one day and you can I, start using it which, again. So, which is what? Sorry? Uh, Disulfiram or antabuse is a, a drug that you would take that if you have a sip of alcohol, you'll immediately start vomiting. Oh, okay, and I've heard get of it. Okay, sick, okay. Right? My so job basically on the show, Rob, is to, to like to ask questions when I don't <laughs> understand a word on behalf of the listeners. Yeah. So, right, yeah. Clarify <laughs> the, the overuse of medical terms. I'm the dumb it down but, guy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's true. So, this oh. medication is designed to get you really sick if you use. Okay. okay. Why okay. don't we use it for everyone? Because the data shows unless somebody's watching you take it every time, people just stop taking it. And mm. then they start drinking and then it doesn't do anything. Yeah. So uh, yet many of us still use it just at a, a lesser scale. Um, that's the problem with naltrexone. So naltrexone, you have no tolerance. So what suboxone and methadone keep your tolerance to opioids very high. So if I use an opioid, I won't overdose because I have very high tolerance. Naltrexone doesn't keep any tolerance. You have no tolerance at all. It just, it's an antagonist or it blocks your opioid receptor so the opioid can't come onto it. Mm. So you can't get high on it. But if I just stop taking my naltrexone and tomorrow I go get fentanyl, my risk of death is super high. Gotcha. So it, it really, I, I don't use it at all uh, for opioid use disorder. It is in the uh, Alberta primary care guidelines is one of the treatments. And many of us were quite upset that it was there, but there's evidence for it. Uh, but the evidence comes from like the, the heroin or prescription uh, opioid days, not from the fentanyl days. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is a, a danger to use it with fentanyl mm -hmm. unless you got the depot. Right. Cause but we don't have it in Canada. 
So yeah. it's, it's the most frustrating in Canada. Thing. Is that something that you would be a problem? Oh, 100%. Of? It would yeah. be a first line treatment. It is a first yeah. line treatment in the US. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. It, it's the company deems Canada too small. So I sat on a provincial committee that approved it uh, with that was years ago with the former government. Uh, mm -hmm. I sat on a, a federal committee that approved it. We can't get it approved. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with approval because the, the company won't send it here. So you can get it wow. through special access. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's that's it. And it's expensive. So you have a small subset of the population that can get it. Some uh, actually will drive down to the border and get it out of a mailbox on the other side of the border. Yeah. Uh, What's the advantage, though? Is. Like, because you were saying that the depot form of naltrexone is sort of on par with Suboxone. So if we have Suboxone, yeah. we have Sublocade, what would be the reason to have naltrexone if we have other things that are equivalent? Yeah, so some people get really sick on Suboxone. Uh, some people just can't tolerate. They don't do well with it. Uh, yeah. Some sort of, of genetic uh, drug metabolism, uh, whatever it may be. Um, you know, methadone is is uh, basically a liquid handcuff for many people. It's uh, it's really hard to have a high functioning life and go to a pharmacy once or twice every day. Um, so an extra medication to win. The other part, you know, opioids are still cognitively impairing. Um, Suboxone much less so than, than full agonist because it's a partial agonist, um, which I, I don't know how to. So basically, uh, you have your receptor, you have your drug, and it lands on top and stays there. Um, that's an agonist. It comes and it activates, right? An antagonist comes and blocks it. A partial agonist... If there's not enough activity there, activates it. If there's too much activity there, blocks it. That's so we can what alternate partial agonist between them. Is. Yes. Okay. So if you're on Suboxone and you take fentanyl, it'll block the fentanyl. Okay. Uh, but it'll still activate the receptor so you don't get sick, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, Trexone as an antagonist doesn't have any of the activation of that receptor. So hence, you don't get any of the side effects from the opioids. You don't get constipated. Uh, you don't get cognitive mm. dysfunction. You don't get sleep issues. You don't get opioid-induced depression, opioid-induced anxiety. You don't have any of those other side effects. Now, it has its own side effects, including kind of uh, flattening of, of affect and, and quite simply can be depressing for some people. You don't get the enjoyment out of things that some people would normally get. Um, so there, there's side effects to everything that we take, um, but so really, uh, it's, it's just a, another, it's another option. Tool. Like yes, yeah. a huge yeah. option that would be a, a, a game changer for many people. Mm -hmm. Is it going to turn the world around? No, but it would help uh, in a subset of people that aren't responding well to other meds. Mm -hmm. That's it's funny that it's just, it's the actual company that produces it is the reason that we don't have it. It's not it's not for lack so of regulation. This is what I've been told. Have I gone and talked to that company and sat down with them and said, "Why aren't you in Canada?" No, but we've been told that by many many groups. Really, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. that's unfortunate. That is, it is. Yeah. Well, doctor, I I mean, again, I could I could keep you here forever, but uh, you know, we're at an hour and forty minutes, which is a really long episode. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I add a few ads, we're going to be closer to two hours. So people uh, are hanging in there, right on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like they will. I feel like they will. Oh, that's good. Um, before we go, I just uh, for the listeners, this is something I want to talk about real quick that that happened over the weekend here um, in Mission, BC. We, we did this uh, 24-hour homeless event. Uh, Lisa, I'm, I'm sure you've seen a couple of the reels mm -hmm. that, were, that have come out over the last couple of days. Um, what they did, and, and of course. Uh, Ryan Bathgate, who's our, our Kaleidoscope Wednesday guy, he's, he lives in Mission, and, and he works at the Mission Community Services Center. They did a 24-hour homeless event where seven people were, um, they volunteered to go live as a homeless would for, for 24 hours in, in order to raise money for their mobile medical unit, the, the new one out there. What a, what a great group of people. But what, what we did here at Just Awesome was to um, interview them going in and then interview them afterwards, you know, with, with a quick five minute interview. So uh, watch for that episode. Uh, to, I'm going to get this episode out for the weekend ramble here, and then I'll be hammering down on that. So it should be out on Monday or Tuesday, guys. So uh, take a look or watch, take a listen. Uh, there's a bunch of reels and stuff up on the Facebook page. Uh, some really great things happened there and some, some really great answers too came out of those participants. It's a, it was what a fantastic fundraiser. I think, uh, I think we should all do that once a year, you know, have them in all the major centers. 
really kind of get some attention. So mm -hmm. awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. That brings us to my favorite part of the show, and that's the daily gratitudes. Hey guys, today's daily gratitudes are brought to you by Rosecrest Recovery Services. You might remember Rich Johnson. He was in episode 144. It was a weekend ramble where uh, we got to talk to him about being an interventionist and, and some of the things that that entailed. Anyway, they don't just do interventions. They do family case management and treatment placement as well, which is a free service. So check them out, guys. Calls and emails are, of course, totally confidential. You can call them at 615-484-8792, or you can also give them an email at info at rosecrestrecoveryservices.com. Thanks, guys. Now, here's your daily gratitudes. So, Rob, every day on the Ashes, or every episode on the Ashes to Awesome podcast, we take our daily gratitudes. So you got a few for us? You know, I, I think... I think for everyone listening um, and, and everyone who is, is living with addiction or a family member, or friend of, of someone living with addiction, um, we, we just got to always remember that you got to take it one day at a time and you got to be kind to yourself. Um, I always tell people addiction, when you're in treatment for addiction, it's the most selfish time of your life and it's got to be about you. And just like when the stewardess is telling you when you got to put on your air mask, you put yours on first. This is time for you to put your own air mask on uh, and get well. And you can do it because so many others before you have. And uh, so many people believe in you and recovery is real. Um, my gratitude, it goes out to the listeners. It's always to the listeners. What you guys are doing is amazing. Please keep doing it. I won't list off all the things, but if you see the logo, you know, drop a comment, do a, do a like, a share. You know what you got to do to help us out because you've been doing a lot of it. So thank you very much to each and every one of you. Every time you do these things, you're getting me a little bit closer to living my best life. My best life is to make a humble living, spreading the message. The message is this. If you are in active addiction right now, today could be the day. Today could be the day that you start that lifelong journey. Reach out to a friend, reach out to a family member, call into detox, go to a meeting, do whatever the hell it is you need to do to get that journey started because it is so much better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. And if you are the loved one of somebody who's suffering an addiction right now, just taking the time to listen to this rather long episode, just take one more minute out of your day, text that person, let them know they are loved. Use the words. You are loved. That little glimmer of hope just might be the thing that brings them back. And you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah.